take everything out and forget to put everything back in. As a premier community in Hampton Roads, James City County strives to maintain a high quality of life for all citizens through sound fiscal management and legislative actions. In an ongoing effort to increase transparency, your Board of Supervisors holds public meetings to garner citizen input before making important decisions. Here is tonight's meeting agenda. Stay tuned, the Board of Supervisors meeting will begin shortly. I've called to order this meeting of the James City County Board of Supervisors for a regular meeting. Mr. Stevens, call the roll, please. Uh, Ms. Sadler? Here. Ms. Sadler represents the Stonehouse District. Mr. McGlennon? Here. Mr. McGlennon represents the Roberts District. Ms. Larson? Here. Ms. Larson represents the Berkeley District. Mr. Hipple? Here. Mr. Hipple represents the Powhatan District and is Vice Chair of the Board. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. Eisenhower represents the Jamestown District and is Chair of the Board. Sitting to my left is Adam Kinsman, County Attorney, and I'm Scott Stevens, County Administrator, and it is my pleasure to be Clerk to the Board. Okay, we begin our meeting with a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. And the pledge this evening is from the Berkeley District, so we'll have uh, Ms. Larson do the introduction. Thank you. Uh, leading our pledge this evening will be Reed Forney. Uh, Reed is a fifth grade student at Matoka Elementary. Reed is the son of Heather and Andy Forney. Uh, dad is deployed right now, so we want to thank both um, of your mom and your dad for the service to our country. We very much appreciate it. Reed is president of the SCA. He is on the honor roll and plays rec basketball on the Hurricanes. Uh, we want to also thank Rose Burwell, Reed's teacher, and one of the advisors for the SCA for Matoka for being here this evening. So, Reed, if you'll come up for the moment of silence and then lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. We have a certificate for you, Reed, and a pen for James City County. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, this evening we have uh, several presentations, and I'm going to start by asking Chief Ash to come to the podium, and I'll come down there with him, and we're going to do a retiree recognition first. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, it's a great honor tonight that we're here to recognize Kenny Driscoll and his retirement. So Fire Marshal Kenny Driscoll began his public safety career with the James City County Police Department in July of 1995. After serving as a patrol officer for several years, he transitioned to the fire department, working primarily at Fire Station 3 and 4. And in 2004, Kenny was appointed as an assistant fire marshal where he was responsible for fire investigations, business inspections, and enforcement of the statewide fire prevention code. In 2015, Kenny was promoted to fire marshal and has been the face of the James City County Fire Department to many property and business owners. As a fire official, Kenny frequently worked with community development to review design plans and ensure our department had access and the resources to help the community during an emergency. Kenny represented James City County on several regional committees related to fire prevention efforts throughout Hampton Roads and the Commonwealth of Virginia. 
Kenny, thank you for your many years of service to our community and the lives you've impacted. We wish you the very best in your retirement. Also with Kenny this evening is his family, his wife Amy, his daughter Courtney, and his son Bodie. presentation is a, a proclamation we have and I would like to ask Ms. Robin Bledsoe to come up. Robin. Whereas Ms. Robin Bledsoe has served the citizens of James City County as a member of its planning commission from February 2012 to October 2017 and on the Economic Development Authority from November 17 to uh, 2017 to December 2019 and whereas Ms. Bledsoe has served as the chairman of the 2013, 14, and 17 policy committee, and whereas Ms. Bledsoe provided her leadership as vice chair and chair of the EDA throughout her appointment, and whereas Ms. Bledsoe's service, uh, during Ms. Bledsoe's service, the Planning Commission reviewed sub substantive updates to the zoning ordinance, subdivision ordinance, and considered numerous legislative development cases and participated in the update of the comprehensive plan toward 2035 leading the way. And whereas the EDA of James City County benefited from the uh, vision and guidance provided by Ms. Bledsoe, and whereas Ms. Bledsoe represented the EDA on several outside agencies, including the Greater Williamsburg Partnership Board of Directors and the Eastern Virginia Regional Industrial Facility Authority, and whereas throughout her period of service, Ms. Bledsoe gave freely of her time, energy, and knowledge for the betterment of James City County and its citizens, now therefore be it resolved that I, Chairman of the Board of Supervisors of James City County, Virginia, hereby proclaim sincere appreciation and gratitude for her dedicated service to the citizens of James City County, to Ms. Robin Bledsoe, in witness whereof we've set the hand and the seal of the county, 14th day of January, 2020. And we have that for you, and, and then we also have, since you were up here to dais, we're going to retire your number <laughs> and, and let, you, let, you, let you have your number. Quite done, but you can sit down. But we're, okay. we're, we're going to still keep asking. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. Uh, I will start out by saying that I've worked with Robin for quite a while, and it is. It is always refreshing to see someone who just so totally and selflessly dedicates herself to the community like she did, um, and it's it's to the benefit of all of our citizens the, the work she's done for us and. I can't tell you, Robin, how much I appreciate that uh, that work ethic and, and, the, and the ability to get things done that you've brought to James City County. And I wanted to open it up to my colleagues so that they had an opportunity to, to uh, uh, have their, their say as well. <laughs> this is the roast. Oh, it's our opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for everything you've done for the community. You have been so engaged in all different aspects of James City County. You've helped each and every one of us in, in our roles as, as county leaders and, and your role as a leader in the community. And, and you don't find that very often when you do. It's very nice to see that, uh, you know, you have somebody in the community that wants to get involved and wants to do their very best. And, and I can say you put 100% in every time that you got up there and, and um, hit every ball you struck at right out of the park. So thank you very much for all your hard work. I don't know that I can add a whole lot except to say that your community, your communication skills are outstanding. And I, that's one of the things that I will definitely miss is that you always made sure to, to close a loop and to make sure that everybody was on the same page with information. And I think especially in this day and time, that's so very important. And so I will miss that. I will obviously, you are a ball of energy. Um, I don't think that we will get anyone 
to occupy any of those roles that you had that will put the time and energy into it that you have. And so I thank you tremendously for that. And I'll just add, Robin, that uh, I think our first encounter was when you were working with a nonprofit in the community. Uh, and so in addition to all the good work you've done for the citizens through the county government, uh, the work that you've done with nonprofits and advocacy groups is really something that's made the community much stronger. So very much appreciate that. And uh, for any uh, challenges or difficulties I've placed you in, I apologize. <laughs> our, our own little joke there. <laughs> Yes, right. <laughs> well, as the liaison from the Board of Supervisors to the EDA, I just want to extend my deepest appreciation to you for everything that you've done. Now I'm going to cry. Don't wipe me. <laughs> for everything you've done um, for James City County, for the EDA, all the other organizations you've participated in. You bring top-notch professionalism, and you, you bring your A-game to everything that you do. I, I just, I can't thank you enough as a colleague and as a friend for the, um, the, the wonderful um, example that you've set for others. You know, it's, it's going to be tough shoes to fill. And um, you have created an atmosphere for the business community, uh, for, the, for those folks to know that um, James City County appreciates businesses. And you kind of got that ball rolling. It's been rolling, but you kind of, as Michael said, knocked it out of the park. So thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the asset that you are as friends and as co to colleagues and to everyone. We can't thank you enough. And we'll miss you behind the scenes up here, but we all know we all know where you live. So we'll, we'll all be able to still have coffee and get together. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate you so much. And you, to your wonderful uh, family for supporting you as well. And Thank Robin, you, Robin. Um, we're going to extend the opportunity for rebuttal. So you, you, have, you have the. the <laughs> I will be very, very brief. Um, thank you very much to each one of you for giving me the opportunity to serve you and work with you. It was an honor that is, is hard for me to describe. I learned so much from each of you. And to Mr. Stevens, our county administrator, and the county staff, I will miss all of you. I learned more from you than I know I ever gave back um, to Mr. Holt, who was <laughs> um, just an unbelievable mentor and guidance to, that he offered me on the Planning Commission. It is invaluable, and um, I think we're a better community because of the staff of James City County. To the citizens of James City County serve. We have great boards and commissions. We have an unbelievable group of elected leaders, but they can't do it by themselves. They need your help, and you will receive more than you can possibly imagine by doing so. Thank you again. It's been my honor, and I certainly didn't expect this, but thank you very much. And good thank luck. You, <laughs> thank, thank, you. thank you, Robin. Okay, the next item on our agenda is public comment, and I believe we have... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I skipped right over. Uh, James City County recognized by 2019 Digital County Survey. Mr. Patrick Page, how could I skip that? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Patrick Page. I'm Director of Information Resources Management here at James City County. It's my pleasure to inform you that James City County has been recognized as a uh, leading county for programs that encourage government innovation and collaboration in the 2019 Digital County Survey. Awarded by the Center of Digital Government and National Association of Counties, we were ranked fifth nationally for populations up to 150,000. This is the first time James City County has been recognized as a top digital county. The survey identifies the best technology practices among U.S. counties that focus on streamlined delivery of government services, encouragement of open data practices, fostering the collaboration of shared services, enhancing protection efforts in the area of cybersecurity, and contributing to disaster response and recovery efforts when necessary. This recognition reaffirms our commitment to the county strategic plan adopted by the board in 2016 with the goals of modern infrastructure, facilities, technology systems, and exceptional public service. I'd like to acknowledge all the divisions in information resources management for their efforts recognized by the survey. Cybersecurity and infrastructure, core application support, 
geographic information systems, video production, web publications, and records management. Several new initiatives introduced between 2018 and 2019 led to this recognition. Modern cybersecurity infrastructure and emergency responsiveness. Expanding online services for permitting inspections with permit link and online payment with invoice cloud. Providing open data and transparency through the use of modern business intelligence tools. Robust mapping and GIS services in support of our property information system. The launch of a new GIS open data website. Innovation in video multimedia with the adoption of high definition cameras, aerial drone footage, live streaming to public meetings, indexed videos on demand, the use of time lapse photography, and interactive 360 media. Innovation and outreach and information delivery systems, including emergency alerts, integration of social media and podcast platforms. Improved citizen engagement with the implementation of smart forms, online page turning publications, and a commitment to universal content accessibility. And continued dedication to transparency with online records archives. So what's next for James City County? Increased uh, cybersecurity training for our staff, the introduction of <coughs> network redundancy with fiber optic communication rings, implementation of a new accounting, purchasing, and budgeting system, <coughs> transition to a new GIS software with expanded analysis capabilities, uh, expanded mapping services for next generation 911 system, redesign of our website, which will be coming in the next year or two, standardization of ADA compliance across websites and printed materials. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you and the members of the Board of Supervisors for your support along with Mr. Stevens. In addition, I'd like to thank the talented staff of Information Resources Management and all the departments in the county for their hard work to make this recognition possible. Thank you. Thank you. I, this was a, a, a very well-deserved honor, and, I, and please pass my sincere thanks to, on to all of the staff for all the good work that's led to this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, sure. Mr. Driscoll got out of here so quickly that I didn't have an opportunity, and, and the way this is going to come out when I say I've had lots of dealings with fire marshals, probably not going to sound <laughs> real good, um, but I have had on occasion to have interactions with Mr. Driscoll and I'm very much going to miss his presence in the fire department and I just want to thank him for his long tenure of service to James City County and I know that you know it's those positions sometimes are easy to fill but you can't always get that historical knowledge and he's somebody that is known he's from to the community his daughter works for um, the business council and so they are family with deep roots here so I just want to say thank you for that recognition to the chief and and if you have an opportunity please tell mr. Driscoll thank you as well so thank you okay we are now to public comment and we have one speaker tonight uh, Ms. Peg Foreman Happy New Year to all of you. Happy New Year. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, Mr. Stevens, Mr. Kinsman, Mr. Purse, and Mr. Hold. Be nice to see all of you this evening, but my best wishes to Robin Bledsoe and to Kenny Driscoll. Like you said, they get away and you don't have a chance to say hello or happy or whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm Peg Borman, 17 Settlers Lane in the Lightfoot area. And trash talk, three R's. Clean County, all that's me. That's what I'm about. And, but I need you. I need you and you and you and all of you. Um, we need you because everyone is needed. The trash problem can't be solved until we all get involved. Uh, the commission um, is very much involved and committed, but we're small in numbers. 
Uh, there's three of us that are retired. That's Charles, Mark, and myself. Uh, there is four who are still working, Alexa, Emma, Kevin, and Tim. And we are still one short on the districts of having a representative. But uh, even though we're committed, there are several things that can only be done during the work week. Will Barnes and I were co-chairman, as you probably remember, and he's been gone now over three years. And he and I did a lot to help Don, and I'm still doing a lot to help Don on a regular basis during the week. But um, uh, she could really use a part-time assistant. She could use a, she has an intern that comes in occasionally and helps her out. and. And, um, but that's only for a short period of time. Our commission wants and could do much, much more, but we do need your help. And Dawn has limited time for us. See, I'm putting a plug in for Dawn, I guess you know. <laughs> but anyway, I plead with you to help us by getting additional commissioners from your district. We could, we could have two or three from each district. We already have a two from one district, I can't remember which one it is, but anyway. But help us by committing to support our efforts along with whatever Dawn's doing because we have a lot of, of things that we're doing out there. And help us by letting us know if there are problems in your district that needs attention from our commission. Help us in our efforts to further the events that we sponsor and coordinate. Some of you I know have been at different things that we've had and it's most gratifying to know that we have your support. Uh, March 28th will be our first spring cleanup this year. So hopefully, and that's also the weekend of the Great American Cleanup. We've moved it up a week so that we can do it. But also set the April the 4th as a rain date, but pray for no rain so that we can get it over with. Uh, we're going to be doing a litter survey on January the 4th. We're about three months out of sync with that. We've got lots of room in the van. If any of you would like to go with us, meet us at 830 at the Tuning Road office, 107 Tuning Road. Um, it's a lot of fun. We tour the entire county, and sometimes we find lots of litter in one place and not so much in the other, so we're always pleased when we don't find it. Um, and that's the 24th of January at 8.30, so come join us for the day. We plan to participate in the Park and Rec's activities on March the 21st, which is the Fido Fest, and that's just one of the many that we'll be um, partic participating in. Once again, we need you and 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 all of you. So. Uh, please contact myself, 565-0032, or Dawn is at 259-5375. You can also email me at pbormancox.net. And whether you like it or not, I'm going to just keep on talking trash. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Borman. Okay. Okay, that closes our public comment. We now move to the consent calendar. Uh, we have on the consent calendar minutes adoption, contract award for fuel depot services, service agreement for household chemical collection services, and then Old Town Medical and Dental Center addition of marketing and communications specialist. Uh, is there a motion to pull any item or would someone move the uh, agenda? Move the adoption of the consent calendar. Yeah, we have a motion to adopt. Mr. Stevens, call the roll, please. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlynn? Aye. Mr. Rice? No. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, we now move to our public hearings, and I would like to acknowledge that uh, our public, uh, our uh, planning commission rep tonight is Mr. Tim O'Connor. He's over here to talk to us. Uh, our first public hearing this evening is uh, FY 2021-2022 pre-budget public hearing. Um, and we're going to have Ms. Sharon Day uh, give the presentation. And then we will open the public hearing and take public comment. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. The purpose of this public hearing is to invite comments and suggestions from citizens for the upcoming budget cycle, which will be for fiscal years 2021 and 2022. 
The comments and suggestions made at this pre-budget public hearing will help guide the staff in preparing a budget proposal for the board's review in May. No board action is being requested at this time. Any questions for Ms. Day? Ready? We will open the public hearing, and I have four speaker cards. Our first speaker is Ms. Leanne Harrell. Hello, good evening, Chairman Eisenhower, members of the board, and Administrator Stevens. My name is Leanne Harrow, and I am the Stewardship and Outreach Manager at this historic Virginia Land Conservancy, located at 5000 New Point Road in James City County. I'm here tonight to reinforce the importance of land conservation to our community and to specifically support reviving the PDR program in James City County during the next budget period. This historic Virginia Land Conservancy is grateful for the funding it receives from the county and others that allow our organization to carry out the mission of protecting and preserving significant natural, scenic, agricultural, and historic land in the lower James, York, and Rappahannock River watersheds. This year, we celebrate our 30th year. In James City County alone, we have protected over 1,500 acres and much of that land possessing scenic, historic, agriculture, and environmental characteristics. As a resident of James City County for the past 20 years, I have seen how the county has transformed from a predominantly rural character onto a more urban and suburban environment. Our county continues to experience pressure from multiple sources to develop our undeveloped areas. Maintaining the unique character of our community into the future will take vision and sensible planning. As conveyed in the citizen commentary for the James City County's Comprehensive Plan's vision statement, a common theme prevailed, and that is to keep the James City County a special place to live, work, and play by identifying the most critical land use issues, which are growth, environment, and maintaining our enticing community character. Land conservation helps communities protect the bottom line in five key ways by reducing the tax burden on residents, by improving property values, attracting business investment, reducing spending on infrastructure, and promoting healthy lifestyle and public health. As far as reducing the tax burden on residents, converting open space to residential development almost always costs more to fund the required services needed than the community can expect to realize in taxes. In fact, a recent study addressing the socioeconomic impact of conserved land in the lower Chickahominy River watershed prepared for by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality revealed that in James City County, for every $1 spent annually in the provision of public services to support land with conservation easements, revenue to James City County were estimated to be $1.53, a net gain. As far as attracting business investments, studies show that there are strong links between community character and economic development. After having served two terms with the James City County EDA, I understand that business leaders today recognize that environment is a critical factor in where companies decide to locate. With increasing technology, companies and employees are less tied to a particular place and have increased flexibility to choose areas where a better quality of life and increased with the increased community attributes. Community image is critical to economic vitality as well as a desirable quality of life. Land and water conservation constitutes a vital public service and remains a critical factor in the health of our community. A PDR program would allow the cost of conserved lands for agriculture and open space values to be shared by all beneficiaries, the landowners, the community, and the public at large. The budget decisions made today will benefit citizens for generations. The historic Virginia Land Conservancy cares deeply about protecting these special lands in James City County and respect, respectfully asks that the 2021-22 budget reflect the citizens' expressed desire by including the funding for this critically important effort of, to revive a county program to protect our land. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. David Allen. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Allen and I live at 2001 Bushneck Road in Williamsburg, Virginia. 
I'm here to speak in favor of bringing back the James City County PDR program. Let's get right to it. Everybody wants to live in a beautiful place. Everyone wants access to clean rivers for recreation, beautiful forests for hunting, and lovely rolling lands for the view. That is either why we have continued to live here all our lives or why we have moved here. There is nothing more beautiful than a ride down Forge Road or Jolly Pond Road to see the gorgeous lands, grazing horses, and plentiful wildlife. Nothing more amazing than a cruise down the Chick to see that very little has changed since this country was originally settled. And if preserving all that beauty were free, I guess we wouldn't be here. But it isn't. The properties we all enjoy are owned by someone, someone who pays the taxes, mows the fields, harvests the crops, maintains the fences, and clears the brushes. Owning rural lands is a commitment of back, heart, and wallet. It's endless. There is always something to be done. Downsizing is never an option for a farmer. And if we want them to do it forever, to give up the right to subdivide, cash out, we have to buy that right the right they have to develop their property. It's only fair. Most of us see our properties as a significant portion of our estates, and if we're going to ask folks to reduce that in any way, even if they believe in the concept of conservation, they have to be paid. So that brings to mind the one objection you might hear from some residents. Go ahead, preserve all the lands you want, but not with my tax dollars. Well, that's the interesting thing about PDR. It's pretty much a revenue neutral proposition. Where the beauty already exists, where no bulldozer is necessary, rather the land just needs to be preserved. Over time, you find that the cost of conserving one property is directly offset by the increase in tax revenue generated by surrounding properties. Whether it's because of supply and demand, there's less property available. Or it's because folks are willing to pay more to live in a beautiful area. I, I don't know, but it works. So if we can develop a good program, one is fair to both the property owner and the county, and is focused on the pur purchase of development rights in areas that will have the greatest impact on maintaining what we all love about this county, its rural way of life, views, timberland, and waterways, then I think it will work, and more importantly, it will make our grandchildren proud. Aside from educating our children and creating a safe place for them to live, I can think of no greater gift we can give our heirs than to leave them this beautiful land just as it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Next speaker is Mr. Jay Everson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jay Everson, 103 Branscom Boulevard. Happy New Year, and congratulations on um, Ms. Larson and Mr. McGlennon's um, overwhelming victories this past uh, November. Uh, I'm here on the elementary school. Uh, I was very gl glad to see that they have moved uh, high school classroom expansion out, and they moved the middle school expansion out. I don't think I'll be alive. It's back in <clears throat> at the 32 range. Uh, the reason they stated for doing both of those <clears throat> was because the numbers on the future think were flat. Well, they're flat in the elementary school also. They continue to not address the issue about age-restricted communities. <clears throat> I thought we were making progress because four years ago, they had 15% growth of students at Colonial Heritage. Last year, they reduced it to six to ten i mean up to six percent pardon me this year they've increased at six to ten there are no kids out there they can't have kids out there and they continue to use those building permits of which there are a boatload every year to drive the number of kids that will show up at our schools second thing is they continue to use uh, <clears throat> average household size at 2.9. The U.S. Census says it's 2.5. And that impact is huge when you start going out in time. Now, on the elementary school, 
I saw, as you did, at your joint meeting with the city council and the school board, the pictures of Norwich. Okay, we got a problem in Norwich. There is no dispute on that point. However, they're using currently nine classrooms for 107 bright beginning students at Norwich. That's 12 per class, which is consistent with the state law about how many kids you can have. If those kids were not there, the same nine classrooms at a, at a low end of 20 would be 180 new spots for elementary school kids, which would in fact ease the pressure on that school. Forget about redistricting, it would relieve the pressure there. A year ago, the, 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 uh, um, the central office indicated to the school board that they could build facilities for bright beginnings of 180 kids for 4.5 million. There's 342 to 360, depending upon where you look on their numbers. They have different numbers depending on where, they get, where you look. To the state, they said like 360, I think it's 358, and on your stuff they provided you, it says 342. In any event, it's under 360. That's 9 million. I was encouraged when I saw they reduced the amount of what they wanted to spend on the elementary school from 38 to 29. I said, oh, there you go. There's the 9 million for the, for the um, Bright Beginnings facilities. But no, 2025, they want 22 million to build Bright Beginnings facilities. Folks, we can solve this problem, which is the Bright Beginnings students, coupled with redistricting, for 9 million. You could reduce the problem in Norge per se this year because four and a half million is just about the Tommy tax and that could be pay go you wouldn't have to borrow all this money because when you start borrowing the money for 29 million plus four million of you know just the infrastructure cost of that building not counting teachers I mean you're looking forensic accountant who looked at the numbers told me you're about six to seven cents on a real estate tax for an elementary school when we can solve the problem, which is bright beginnings, we need to solve the problem. I do not understand why they do not want to solve the problem. They want to build all this stuff, this empire, I guess. I don't understand it. But in any event, I hope that you can get them, or you guys can see it clear. They take that elementary school thing off of that CIP and put bright beginnings in and be done with this. I'm getting tired of telling you guys, talking to you guys about this. I'm sure you're tired of hearing from me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker is Pam McGregor. Good evening, everyone. A happy new year. Uh, just a quick uh, message from the Ark of Greater Williamsburg. Uh, we have proudly uh, served adults in this community since 1976. We're entering our 44th year. We have a tagline, the ark is there when the school bus stops coming. And that helps people to understand that as um, people with disabilities age out of special education at age 21, the ark is there. And we have been for many years. Thanks to John Carnifax and James City County Parks and Rec, uh, in addition to the 8 to 10 evening programs that we've been providing all these years, in 2016, we started a day program called Arc of Abilities. And what that has done has been life-changing. While the program is a sweet program and we do many things, continuing education and vocational training, what it has done in this community has raised awareness of the people that we're privileged to serve because oftentimes adults with disabilities are just under the radar. They're not able to come in here and speak to you the way I am right now. So I'm very proud to represent a large group of people in our community and hopefully many more. We are submitting a grant this year. We were not funded last year because you were in the second year of a budget cycle. We understood that. The majority of our families are in James City County, so I'm very hopeful this year. But I want to share one new uh, program that we are launching in 2020. It is called Wheels for Work. This is a partnership with so many entities in our community that this is what nonprofits in this community that are doing well have figured out, and that's collaborating and working together. 
As the chairman of the Health Committee at the Chamber Alliance, I sat in a committees with many people from different senior living communities and other health-related uh, fields, as well as other nonprofits. And what has happened has been exciting. Williamsburg Landing and Windsor Mead Senior Living Communities approached me at roughly the same time, a little over a year ago, and pitched to me the idea that if people with disabilities were trained to specific jobs and well prepared, they would be willing to hire our clients at 30 hours plus a week with benefits. I don't throw around the word or term life-saving very often, changing very often, often, but for a person with Down syndrome or with cerebral palsy or with autism, suddenly having a job in this community that could become their career and have benefits is in fact life-changing, not only for the person, but for the caregiver. Because many caregivers, as their loved one ages out of school, they have to make the hard decision of who's suddenly gonna be home and watching out for them. And in some cases, they're just left at home alone. So that's two parts, uh, two organizations that have come forward. Between them, they have provided 10 different job descriptions. I have met with the senior leadership at both senior living communities, and I explained to them, this just can't be a couple of nice people that think it would be nice to hire somebody with a disability. This has to be a culture of care. It has to start with that CEO and permeate right through to the residents, and they are on board. We have one woman who is already working at Windsor Mead, and she has become a star. She's their cookie baker. But the point is, is Wheels for Work has four parts. The ARC will always advocate for people. And now we will train. We've hired somebody who will begin the process of training to these job descriptions and serving as the liaison to those senior living communities. We have, in the meantime, as the word is starting to filter out, had other companies come to us and say, hey, hold on. We would love to hire people with a disability. But here is the crux. Across America, 67% of Americans with disabilities that have the ability to work but do not, it's because they lack reliable transportation. And that means you hire a grocery store hires somebody. They can take the bus sometimes. They have a ride sometimes, but pretty soon they're late. They don't show up. The, the employer throws up his hands or her hands and says, you know what, I tried this, it's not working. The ARC is now working with the Department of Rail and Public Transportation and some other nonprofits in the community, and we're partnering to have a call center. So our clients, once trained and prepared to apply for these jobs at Windsor Mead or at, at Williamsburg Landing, when those jobs are open, no special uh, deals are being made, they will be able to call into a center and say, this is my schedule next week and have reliable transportation to and from. And what the senior living communities gain is an opportunity to have people that will stay in the job because they have so much turnover. So I wanted to share the Wheels for Work project with you. Thank you for your service. And just know that we are out there and we welcome uh, your visits and support anytime. Thank you, happy new year. That's all of our public speakers. Uh, public hearing. Uh, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing at this time. Advertise for that, for the next one too, don't we? Yes, you can go ahead and close it. Okay, sir. so we will close the public hearing. And no action is required at this time. We will move to number two, amendment to county code section 16-22 to permit certain uses of metal detectors. Mr. Perkinson will do the staff presentation. To chairman, members of the board. Um, we're here tonight to look at uh, an amendment to our current 16-22 uh, code, which prohibits the use of metal detectors in parks. Um, we would like to add uh, a change to that code that would allow the Director of Parks and Recreation to designate areas where that activity would be allowed. Um, to give you a little bit of history on this, we have been approached um, by citizens in the past, and I believe some board members have as well. Um, about that activity. When we started to do our research and look at other localities on the peninsula, we found that uh, most, if not all, do allow metal detecting on man-made beachfronts. Um, so for, 
what we would try to do if this if this code was changed is we would establish um, an area on the man-made sandy beach at Jamestown Beach Event Park where people could um, partake in this activity. Um, we'd have certain guidelines in place to keep them on the sandy areas um, and away from the vegetated areas. And it would be in a time frame um, that the park's not as busy, so between Labor Day and Memorial Day um, in the off-season time there. So. All righty, any questions? For Mr. So, Mr. Perkins, if I may just... Uh, to make sure that everybody understands this. So what you're really asking for is a change that would be permissive. It would allow us to, to uh, provide a policy that uh, would um, uh, allow for metal detectors on, on the public uh, beach, uh, but not uh, require that we do it, and so that if it didn't work out, we could always Correct. revise Correct. the policy. So we could, we could see how it works out, and if we needed to change it, we could. Um, but the actual ordinance would just allow the Director of Parks and Rec to designate an area. So. So is the, is the Director of Parks and Rec going to be available for questions? Possible? Sure. Okay. Do you want to do after the public hearing or now? Um, if you would like now, let's sure. do it. Sure. So one thing that does, I mean, Jamestown Beach isn't quite as large, or maybe you're going to tell me differently, as a Yorktown Beach or some of these other peninsula areas so I like the um, uh, Labor Day to Memorial Day because I don't do you foresee any issue between people who are using the beach for recreation and people who might want to be um, metal detecting so there's a territorial issue going on yeah I, th I think when we talk to other localities you know some require permits and fees to do it we wanted to kind of ease into this in a way that we similar to the geocaching that popped up years ago where they would place things in the parks and you know they would use the gps to find to navigate to these places we kind of eased into that and the same thing we want to try here uh versus having a permit and you would have to come in and apply and pay a fee and it would say these are the hours we wanted to open it up broad and by changing the ordinance we can try this at the beach this year and there may be opportunities in other parks down the road say for a short period of time or if there's a need to do some we've had metal detectors go out now and assist us for example in our playgrounds because there were uh, there was a needle found in one playground so we decided let's be a little proactive and so we sent folks out with metal detectors most of them were our staff that went out and did that but there are opportunities i think where metal detection can be helpful uh, but I think the beach is what we saw in other localities where it was pretty open even though some required a permit uh, it was pretty standard for in all localities in the peninsula and they didn't allow it in any other area uh, and some most didn't and some required permits so I think this is a simple way for us to try it uh, try it at the beach outside of the peak season when we don't charge a parking fee uh, we do charge, as you know, non-residents during between Memorial and Labor Day. This way it kind of allows staff the opportunity to see how frequent it is, if there are issues, and then we can adjust through park rules and regulations if we need to. We don't have to come back. We can kind of modify it. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions for staff? All right. We'll open the public hearing, and we have... No speakers? Yes, sir. We'll close the public hearing and I will look to the board for a motion. Of the adoption of the ordinance. A motion, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. All right. Public hearing number three, AFD 19 0002, Croker AFD edition 9896 Sycamore Landing Road. Ms. Tori Haynes will give the staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, Ms. Kelly Fulton has applied to enroll 3.85 acres of land located at 9896 Sycamore Landing Road into the Croker AFD. The parcel is currently undeveloped and forested and is located more than one mile away from the district. When a parcel is located more than one mile from the core, state code allows it to be added if it's found to be agriculturally and forestally significant. 
A forest management plan has been prepared for the owner, which has found that the property consists of an upland hardwood timber type, including red oak, yellow poplar, sweet gum, and loblolly pine. At its October 24th meeting, the AFD Advisory Committee found that the parcel is agriculturally and forestally significant and recommended its addition to the Croker AFD. The Planning Commission subsequently concurred with this recommendation. With these findings and recommendations of approval, staff recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve this application subject to the conditions in the packet. At this time, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions for Mr. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will ask uh, Mr. O'Connor to come give us the Planning Commission comments on this. Good evening, board members. Just hope that uh, one day you'll be as kind to me as you were to Miss Bledsoe tonight. So <laughs> thanks for thanks for recognizing her. Sure, number two. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so this was approved by the Planning Commission six to zero. I was not in at attendance at the meeting, um, but I think Miss Haynes covered it. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, we'll open the public hearing. We have no speakers on this one. Okay, close the public hearing and look to the board for a motion. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Mr. Stevens? Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. We now move to public hearing number four, Z19-0014 slash MP19-0016, the promenade at Jane, John Tyler, proffer and master plan amendment. Mr. Rivero, we'll give a staff presentation. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the Board of Supervisors. Mr. Jerry Bowman of Francisco's at Promenade LLC has submitted a request to amend the adopted proffers and master plan for the promenade at John Tyler to allow for the construction of an additional 10-plex building on the site. The promenade is a master plan community approved by the Board of Supervisors on December of 2014. It consists of up to 204 residential units and approximately 48,000 square feet of commercial use. Entire master plan area is on mixed use with proffers and designated mixed use by the 2015 comprehensive plan and located within the primary service area. The proposed 204 residential units are distributed in the following types of structures. 11 10-plex buildings, 40 duplex buildings, 14 multifamily units or the live above units associated with the mixed use buildings planned at the out parcels adjacent to Route 199. This amendment application proposes revisions to the adopted master plan and proffers for a portion of the promenade. More specifically, the four out parcels adjacent to Route 199 to allow for the following change. In lieu of constructing the 14 live above units as part of the mixed use buildings at the, at the out parcels, the, the applicant is proposing to build a 10 plex, all residential building in one of the out parcels located at 5311 John Tyler Highway. Reflect this change, the proposed master plan revises the land use designation of a portion of the out parcel located at 5311 John Tyler Highway, which was originally approved for commercial, office, and multifamily units contained within a mixed use structure to a single structure containing 10 residential units to 10 plaques. The amended master plan also revises the land use designations of the remaining out parcels. Originally approved for commercial office and multifamily units contained within mixed use structures to permit standalone commercial and or office structures and open space. The proposed proffer amendment would allow modifying language of proffer number 11, community space, by replacing reference to the amended land use designation from mixed use structures to standalone structures. Staff notes that the revisions proposed by this amendment will not change the previously approved residential density of 8.3 dwelling units per acre, and we will not allow in, any net increase in the total number of residential units previously approved, 204 units. No other changes are proposed as part of this request. All agencies have reviewed this uh, amended application and recommend approval. The staff finds the proposed compatible with surrounding zoning and development and consistent with the recommendations of the adopted comprehensive plan. Staff recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve this application and accept the amended proffers. 
at its November 6, 2019 meeting, the Planning Commission recommended approval of this application and acceptance of the amended proffers by a vote of 5 to 0, with one abstention. At its December 10, 2019 Board of Supervisors meeting, the applicant requested the, that consideration of this application be deferred to the January 14, 2020 Board of Supervisors meeting. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have at this point, and the applicant is also in attendance. Thank you very much. Questions for yeah. Um, I, I'll just uh, ask one question, which I, I think I asked um, um, maybe on email before. But uh, I, I, first, let me just mention that I did meet with Mr. Uh, Getty and, and Mr. Bowman uh, um, to discuss the, the uh, proposal. Um, but um, and, and the issue that I'm um, really focused on is the idea that th there's nothing in um, this application or in the proposal at all that. Uh, would essentially require that eventually that uh, commercial uh, construction take place. Is that right? That is correct, sir. Yeah. Okay. Questions? Okay, um, we will have uh, Mr. O'Connor come forward to the Planning Commission comments. Good evening again. Um, just from the Planning Commission's perspective, I think everybody felt it was a, a consistent use and appropriate use to add the the 10 plex and cleave off the the commercial and instead of having mixed use buildings uh, from the public comment section uh, parking was a concern and the applicant had agreed that they would try to maximize parking so it would relieve some of the parking congestion that was there so again the planning commission approved that five to zero with one abstention happy to answer any questions thank you sir sir Okay, we will open the public hearing, and uh, one speaker is Mr. Vernon Getty. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Vernon Getty. It's my pleasure to be here representing the applicant. Also here is Jerry Bowman, who leads the Franciscus organization now. Um, this is the area of the master plan for the promenade in question here, and this depicts the new proposed 10-plex building. Uh, there, you'll see it's right at the end of a row of the 10-plex buildings. This is a blow-up of the existing master plan that shows one of the mixed-use buildings that would be in the, that same location with parking uh, under the existing plan. Um, it's a very attractive development if you haven't been there. This is a 10-plex building right across the street from where the new one would be built. Uh, and this is the row I pointed to earlier, uh, the public park in the middle. And this is the location of the new proposed building. We think this is a good proposal. Um, as staff has said, there are no adverse impacts from this proposal. Um, there are no new units. Of, um, being proposed, there is no reduction in the number of commercial square feet proposed. Um, at present, and this was as of, I think, December, um, there were 125 units that had been completed in the project, and 114 had been sold and occupied, and the school folks have indicated to us that there were 11 school children. Um, and Looking at the fiscal impact at that stage of the development, it projected there would be 19, and at build out there would be 34. So, if the project continues uh, at the same pace with school children, you would end up with 20, which is a fairly significant reduction in the number of children uh, projected for this development. And that would make a significant impact, about $113,000 to the good in the fiscal impact from the project. Um, we also think this is a project that's had the effect that was hoped for when it was originally approved. Um, it not only provides quality workforce housing, um, you'll recall 100% of the units here are proffered to be in accordance with the HOP policy and 80% of the units are proffered to be in the lower two tiers, 16% in the 30 to 60 AMI and 64% um, in the middle range, the uh, 60 to 80. Um, I think this has really helped with the revitalization of the whole Williamsburg Crossing project. 
I'm sure you've seen that there's been investment in the shopping center, occupancy up, and there's a whole just good vibe in that uh, entire development now. The other point I think is important is this change by allowing 10 units to be built in a 10 plex uh, and taking the mixed use buildings off the table and those out parcels really makes those par out parcels more marketable and more desirable for commercial development. Um, the applicant is and has been actively pursuing uh, development options and the commercial brokers and people in the business it deals with are telling them these unit the, it's more marketable as pure commercial and likely office you know some sort of medical use perhaps um, but that there is no particular market for mixed use buildings on those particular out parcels so we think this is good and from that aspect as well uh, we agree with the staff report and we agree with the unanimous planning commission recommendation of approval and would urge you to approve this case. Thank you. Of course, be glad to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Getty. Um, the, I, I also met with uh, Mr. Getty and uh, Mr. Bowman and, and um, went over this. Um, and I, I, there were a couple of questions that I that we had discussed, and I, I just wanted to raise again. Um, and that is, we've had, uh, or at least I've had, uh, some concern from citizens, not specific to this, but to noise along 199. And uh, I know this is an area where the speed limit is lower; as it's 45 versus 60. And there is already, I think, some sort of a berm planned. And and. Uh, um, what I was interested in is finding out if there was uh, uh, any ability at the uh, site plan stage to, to try to help maybe um, make sure that that berm maybe helps with the noise issue and, and um, some plannings that will help uh, with the noise issue because ultimately it's going to be the people who live in there who will be dealing with the noise issue of that. Uh, and VDOT's very clear. It's built. There can be no sound walls. So... Uh, uh, that, that's that's one factor. So that um, that and then the other thing we, we discussed, I think, was the potential for um, that. I gather you think think that the it's more likely that the sites, the, the commercial sites, will yes. be developed um, absent the mixed use part. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that there was is there any uh, ability to, to try to maybe. Uh, prep some of the sites to, to, to get them um, uh, ready on, on, on that, or is that uh, something that you, you all would be willing to consider? Uh, I suspect it's something they would be willing to consider. There's always some tension in, about do you clear a site ahead Before of the you time you need yeah. it cleared. But okay. Yeah, I mean, certainly they would, I think. Uh, Jerry, come on. Sure, sir. absolutely. Come on, sir. First of all, like everyone else, Happy New Year. My name is Jerry Bowman. I appreciate you uh, taking the opportunity today to let us make this presentation. Uh, both with respect to the berm, with uh, with planning's you know, permission, we would be uh, more than willing and happy to uh, increase the size of the berm and additional you know, soundproofing. We are, uh, I would point out that this 10-plex that we're talking about is actually farther back than what the, you know, what the building would be, but we're certainly you know, willing to do that. Uh, we were able to, um, you know, to get the additional four parking places. So that's, you know, that is uh, is also in uh, in the in the proposal. And with respect to, um, you know, the uh, the other issue that uh, you know that you just uh, just mentioned, we would I think we'd be very happy to, you know, to work, uh, you know, to work uh, with planning to uh, to accomplish that at site plan review. Great. Great. Thank you, sir. Any other questions for staff? Could you speak to why the mixed use? commercial why that's a tougher sell and I should also say that I spoke with you twice on the telephone problem with the mixed use is that it you know it, it has the concept of having a commercial and a residential component as part of the building and there's relatively very few developers in this community that is uh, are interested in or have the experience in developing uh, you know, multi-use kind of buildings, not a more urban setting. You know, for example, uh, in uh, in Norfolk, where you know where I live, we have a we have a street called Collie Avenue, 
and Cowley Avenue entirely is a is now at least from like 38th Street all the way up to 53rd Street is designed for mixed use and it works beautifully because uh, because um, uh, you've got a lot of you know young people who want to come in have maybe live on the first floor have um, you know have uh, excuse me have have retail on the first floor and then have apartments uh, or other type of uh, condos you know above it. That market is a viable market in a you know, New York City, a big city, and perhaps in certain very minor areas of Norfolk. But here in James City County, we just haven't found any any developers who are willing to you know to, to uh, you know to take you know take that opportunity to develop a multi-use building. We do have Newtown and, and High Street in the city of Williamsburg, and of course now they're New Midtown Row, uh, which uh, follow those kinds of models right. to a much greater extent. I don't think there's any residential above in, uh, not Newtown, not, not in uh, but High Street. High Street, but, yeah. but certainly Midtown Row is uh, designed to have Correct. retail and, uh, yeah. and residential. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right. Let's see, where are we here? I have no other speakers, no other questions? I'll close the public hearing and look to the board for a discussion. Um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and speak. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm not sure what uh, my colleagues are going to do about this. I've, I've not supported this uh, particular development uh, throughout the process, and um, this doesn't, from my perspective, make things um, any better. Uh, uh, the um, uh, fact that there are fewer school children in this particular development is is interesting, of course, but the units themselves are units that could support. Uh, the kind of uh, school population that we base our formula on. And so we can't really assume that we won't wind up with, with additional uh, students. And the commercial aspect really does drive the um, uh, offsetting of the costs of, of the residential units uh, if we accept that formula. Uh, and uh, given the fact that there is no guarantee that the residential, uh, that the commercial um, uh, construction would actually take place, uh, especially in a shopping center which has yet to fill substantially a number of their existing spaces. Um, I, I just don't uh, think that uh, there's a justification for this addition. But uh, as I say, that's the uh, main um, objection that I would have. I think that the um, neighborhood is helping an area that was in bad shape and um, I think it's filling a need for as far as workforce development and workforce housing that we've been trying to get and um, I think they've done an outstanding job and <clears throat> you can tell by the amount of sales that you know it, it's something that's actually working and something that's moving forward um, and I'm encouraged yet yeah, at any time we could have more or less school children but right now we have less than anticipated, which is, you know, I love kids because I have a plenty of them. But um, <laughs> you know, it's always good on our schools to have a little less. So, but um, I think it would be an added benefit to um, move this forward, and and I'll support that tonight. Yeah, I would just like to say that I think I, being familiar with shopping. Um, uh, and I'm in, in that area quite a bit. I've seen an increase in the shopping at that shopping center, so I'm seeing it somewhat revitalized with this um, development over there. Um, it, there are empty storefronts still there, but perhaps with more residential coming in in that already approved area, it's gonna revitalize it even more. And to give that a chance to get um, Moving a little bit more rather than building something else that could potentially have more empty storefronts doesn't seem productive or doesn't make common sense to me. Um, I will be supportive of this because I think I agree with Supervisor Hipple that I think if it gives us more of an opportunity to bring uh, folks into an area that um, have more affordable housing, that's, that's perfect. And um, I, I think that that's gonna be a, a very, um, very good benefit to the area, so I will be supportive of it tonight. I've just not not much to add. Just that uh, I appreciate uh, that 
It's in my district. I appreciate the um, the look. I, I will tell you, when I was on the school board, I about had a meltdown when this was approved by the Board of Supervisors um, because I was very concerned about the number of school children that were coming out of it. Um, we, as members of the School Liaison Committee, while the numbers are down, we, we are in the process of, of needing an elementary school. And so um, I'm glad the numbers are down, but still um, there are school children coming out of there, which is always concerning. Uh, what I don't, you know, not to, to repeat, but I don't want to see something there that isn't going to be successful. I, I don't want to see more empty. You know, luckily, right now, as it appears, most of the empty is on the one side. Um, the, the front and the, and the other side of the, the one that um, goes over towards the, the uh, hospital or the medical offices. I mean, the shopping center has definitely had a resurgence, and, and I'm appreciative of that. And it's being kept up and um, development is um, a very nice development, and so I appreciate that as well. So this is, this is a real tough one for me, um, but I, I do appreciate the time that, um, that Mr. Getty has, has put in to, um, to, to uh, wanting to discuss it, and also the Planning Commission work. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add one, one uh, notion about about the shopping center I mean I, I recognize the shopping center is revitalized and and certainly this development has probably contributed to that but it is not the only factor there is new management at that shopping center that I think has been more critical to the um, uh, change in its uh, success so okay um, my only comments um, when I looked at this I said you know if you're looking at the fiscal impact is the thing I looked at um, and fiscal impact is based on averages. It's we we can find we can always find uh, a fiscal analysis we do based on countywide averages, and then apply it to a specific community and find that it's quite different in that community. But we're we're looking when we analyze these things on, on an average type of thing. So it's it's not really specific. Um, so it does appear that uh, you know that the school impact is less than than. Uh, maybe we had anticipated um, that is very much subject to change uh, you know I moved into Ford's colony we didn't have any school kids now I got them all over the place so you know things do change um, and when we do make these decisions we are making long-term permanent decisions so um, I guess what it really comes down to me is I, I I was very uncomfortable as Mr. McLennan was that the original proposal here did not have any phasing or timing that required the commercial at a certain point and the commercial was what made the fiscal analysis better at least what we were looking at from the beginning um, and either way whether we approve this or don't approve this tonight that doesn't change we have no assurance that the commercial will will come in um, we have some pretty clear understanding from the applicant that it would be easier to do if we if we made this this change so uh, that's sort of a factor that uh, I, I have to I have to consider uh, in looking at this but that's those are the factors I've been wrestling with and it's gonna be a tough one for me so all right any other questions for motion for approval we have a motion for approval mr. Stevens mr. Apple aye mr. McGlennon no Miss Sadler aye Miss Larson aye Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, we are now to board considerations. We have number one, authorization of multiple part time regular positions. Mr. Teague. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Staff has determined that the county needs to convert multiple temporary positions to part-time regular to meet the intent of Chapter 2 of the James City County Personnel Policies and Procedures Manual, Section 2.4. Staff proposes the authorization of the following part-time positions listed in the memorandum. A uh, total of 103 that are 45 positions that are below 1,040 hours a year 
and 58 positions that would be under the 1040. The above 1040 comes with benefits. Uh, the financial impact of the change includes a 2% wage increase that matches what we provided for fiscal year 2020 for part-time regular and full-time staff, and a 10% wage increase required by policy for the five staff and park and recs department who will now be designated as supervisory. The total cost for all departments is 23746600 Staff also proposes approval to appoint the current temporary employees who are interested and currently qualified in the newly established part-time positions. If this is approved, it'll be effective February the 1st, 2020, and we recommend adoption of the attached resolution to create the 103 part-time regular positions, a wage increase, and the ability to appoint existing temporary staff to the newly created positions. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for me? Oh, I guess my question would be more, that's a lot of positions. It, are we looking towards efficiencies of those? I mean, is this the most efficient way to, to do these jobs that we've, I mean, we've looked at all this before we've come right here before us now. Yeah, in the analysis, we reviewed the approximately 350 temporary positions that we have. Okay. And of that, this 103 were identified as working a regular schedule, meaning that we've come to rely on these positions for day-to-day -day operations. And when you look at the department totals, 79 are within our park and recs department. And as a new program or a new park opens, it's typically staffed with a mix of regular and temporary. But as that park increases in visitation and we have more programs offered, the need for those temporary staff really becomes a regular need. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? For approval? We have a motion for approval. Mr. Stevens. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next one is authorization for the creation of assistant director of community development position and transfer of funds from capital projects fund to the general fund. Mr. Purse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, the uh, community uh, development director currently oversees five divisions, along with handling the duties previously encompassed by the planning director position. In order to better provide day-to-day -day management and oversight to these areas, staff is recommending the addition of assistant director of community development position. This organizational model would be similar to what already, already exists in county administration, general services, social services, as well as the police and fire departments. Along with being a needed addition to staff, this position will also be able to oversee the purchase of development rights and open space program. The board had previously directed staff to re-implement and update the current ordinances, procedures, and identify funding options for this. And staff believes that a staff position in this department will have the necessary resources to most fully accomplish this task. Similar positions currently exist in Hanover, Albemarle, and Chesapeake and are comparable to this new position in terms of salary grade and duties. The financial impact for this addition includes four months of salary and benefits not previously adopted in the budget for the fiscal year 2020, totaling $37,045. $37, in future budgets, this position will be budgeted for a full year with a salary starting at $79,000 with fringe benefits totaling $111,132. For the remaining four months, staff proposes transferring money from the existing PDR account, which currently has a balance of $365,966. Approval of this new position requires adoption of a resolution, creating the position as well as moving the one-time $37,045 from the capital fund to the general fund. Staff recommends the, uh, the board adopt the attached resolution. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Morris? No. Um. I heard you say that it's it's comparable our um, one hundred eleven thousand one hundred thirty two dollar um, benefit including benefits package. Um, it's a nice wage, um, you know. And I know we'll need you know you, you, it's harder and harder to find someone to fill that type of position and pay them much less than that. 
um, I may quit this job and hire work, <laughs> come, come apply, but I, no, I'm just playing. Um, but um, how will how will this person's job fall into making sure? Because I, th I think if I get it right, I won't talk for the board. But the PDR program will be coming back in open space, and however we create this new program, whichever whatever we end up calling it, in order to protect the land that we hear from so many citizens that want protected. And um, do we have a job description? I'm, I'm sure I'm probably way ahead of myself, and I know y'all thought thought this through. It just isn't something you just came up with, and I appreciate that. But do we have? How much time would be spent in PDR because as we get PDR or whatever we call this program up and running, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Maybe after we get it going, it won't be as much, but in the very beginning to do it right, which I think we want to make sure we do it right and, and, and get the biggest bang for the citizen buck out of this. Um, do you know how much time it may take or? I know that's a sure. well, hard question. There were a couple questions in there. So, so first to the salary. Uh, from a human resources perspective, we have to evaluate the uh, positions at similar pay grades. So we looked at the assistant directors in all of the different departments we have. Uh, and then we identified other positions outside of the community that also do these same functions. So, so that number wasn't uh, picked out of the air and it wasn't based on what we think we might need to spend. It was based on uh, being comparable with the other positions that we currently have. Uh, second, we tried to, uh, to handle the efficiencies. Ms. Larson asked that as part of the part-time position. Uh, so what we did is we said, well, we could have one position that just does uh, purchase of development rights open space um, because that exists in other localities, but we also have needs in community development in general. Uh, so what we wanted to do was write a job description that uh, could do t multiple things uh, because that is at, the, at that same pay grade is, is, is what exists elsewhere. Uh, so what we're able to do is we're able to, uh, to deal with two things at once. And to your concern about the time that would be spent, uh, that's really an operational uh, directive. Uh, all of that language currently exists in the job description. We had to create the desc job description to get that, uh, that pay scale. Uh, and it, that would fall on Scott and I to really uh, work with Paul to make sure that enough time is being spent on purchase of development rights. I can tell you that the conversations we've had already uh, would indicate that, that initially out of the gate, that is the main focus of that job. And the, and the reasons for my questions are, are not necessarily are y'all doing your job properly, because I know y'all are. Y'all support us very well and, and vet everything out before it ever gets to us and, and more so the questions we can ask. It was more to get it out to the general public Absolutely. That, you know, some people will hear you're hiring one person for one thing, and it's not. It's multiple tasks. We're trying to put two or three people into one person to do a job in the county exactly. and, and do what the citizens are asking for. And in order, as we found in other positions that we offered to less, we couldn't get the qualified people that we needed in order to fill the position. So we had to move that grade pay up. And um, so it was, it was more of an educational thing. And thank you for all that information. You do a wonderful job. Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. Just one other quick question. Um, with the um, resurgence of the, this program, I can see the initial, like Mr. Hippel was talking about, the initial need in the all-encompassing time that's going to take. And even though you have all these other um, job duties that it looks like that you're going to have in this position, um, when the the initial um, load has backed off. Is there going to be enough work? I'm sure there is, but is there going to be enough work for this person as a full-time employee under this title to carry? Yeah, and I think that's why we tried to combine the tasks. I think we wanted to make sure that, um, as you said, out of the gate that we had uh, the time commitment to make it work. Uh, ideally, uh, when I mentioned community development being a natural location for this, uh, this is probably not going to be a one-person job, right? Uh, this person will oversee the, the Purchase and Development Rights Program. Uh, we have planners, we have uh, you know, stormwater people who are all going to be able to uh, participate in this program. We just need to have a point of contact. So after the initial uh, uh, buildup, uh, 
of, of the program. I think some of the job duties will be able to disperse and Paul will be able to use the assistant director as he currently needs it now. Um, but that person will always be available to, to oversee the program because uh, right now you have Adam and I sort of uh, handling all the calls. They come in. There's not one point of contact and we, we get a little uh, uh, confusion when folks want to make changes or want to request information about the Purchase and Development Rights Program. So having somebody sit in that seat and be the, the ultimate point of contact I think will be something that we'll need moving forward uh, regardless of uh, the amount of time needed to be spent on it initially. This person's position would fall under Mr. Hall? Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, um, always struck me is that uh, Mr. Holt has an incredibly large portfolio um, and uh, somehow manages to balance it all, and, and, and that's, that's terrific. But as I recall, we used to have a manager of development management and a planning director uh, for, for years, and uh, that was when our population was significantly smaller than it is now, probably you know, 68,000 as opposed to approaching 80,000 now. Um, and, you know, because of the need to tighten our belts during the Great Recession, that position was kind of merged with lots of other things. And um, so I, I don't doubt there's going to be a need for um, uh, somebody to help out uh, with all those different different areas that you seem to be dealing with here. And I'm encouraged to hear that, you know, you're, you're recognizing that there is um, a need to oversee people who will be given specific tasks to carry out. I think what would be helpful too is if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about what are the needs in community development. And I do think we do run a pretty tight ship here from, from what I've seen for the past four years. But, and how are those if there are current needs, how are they being handled now? Is, is Mr. Holt just taking on more or the plan, you know, how are we dividing up what, what this extra work currently? Sure, sure. well, uh, so I mentioned that community development department uh, oversees five divisions. That would be planning, zoning, uh, neighborhood, neighborhood, de uh, neighborhood development, uh, building safety and permits, and then a partial oversee of the stormwater, uh, the development plan review uh, part of that. So I think from Paul's perspective, uh, that's a lot to that's a lot to, to take on. And to Mr. Uh, Mr. McGlennon's point, the planning director had a lot of uh, review responsibility in terms of development cases, uh, comprehensive plan uh, oversight as well. So having somebody come in to be able to handle uh, the over, uh, oversight of all of those divisions, I think will help sort of spread the load a little bit. I, I know we also have a lot of transportation projects uh, and then PDR as well. So, so Paul ha has had a lot of that, um, but we really do have a strong staff at all of the different levels. So right now we have principal planners uh, for comprehensive plan and for current planning. So they do a, a lot of the work in terms of uh, uh, shepherding those programs through the county. Uh, our stormwater department has a really strong staff uh, of folks who have been here for, for many, many years uh, th that are able to handle those. So, so Paul's able to sort of offload a lot of the day-to-day uh, -day functions uh, th that a community development director would otherwise handle. I think this lets him be a little more involved in all of that, uh, uh, making sure that he has uh, a good, good oversight on everything. I think that's what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. And so we will, if this is approved tonight, I take it you'll work with Human Resources and this will be posted? Shortly. All right. It, it does strike me that in a lot of ways that um, we, we do play whack-a-mole um, around here sometimes that, uh, you know, uh, you just start getting your hands around one issue and another one will pop up someplace else. And uh, some of the things that we think really want to get done, um, just have to take a back seat sometimes. And I think it, it's important for us to recognize that we need some help in moving yeah, things along. I, I think the people on the uh, Affordable Housing Task Force might appreciate if this person might take some of that on and we might see some things come out of that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I have a motion for approval. Motion for approval. Mr. Stevens. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. We are down to board requests and directives. Oh, it's I'm sorry. on the end. It's a new, <laughs> new position here. I'm trying to think of what all I've done. Um, uh, I wasn't ready for that. 
Sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and you, can, you can come back We're to good. you. You want? Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of, of things quickly. Um, uh, first of all, um, on uh, Saturday, I attended a service for Edith Edwards, uh, the um, uh, uh, spouse of Jack Edwards, who served on this board for I think 30 years, um, 30 maybe 32, uh, and uh, uh, it was a it was a, a, a very uh, lovely service at St. Martin's, um, and uh, about 500 people showed up for that uh, for that service. So. Um, recognition of Edith's um, uh, powerful role in the community over the years. Um, secondly, I wanted to mention that uh, along with Ms. Larson and, and Mr. Eisenhower, who attended uh, VML VACO uh, Finance Forum in Richmond uh, on the 6th of January, uh, and uh, that was a, a very interesting um, set of presentations. Uh, where we uh, learned about the um, impact of the governor's budget proposals on local government and uh, also saw a presentation on some opportunities that may be there for local governments to get greater relief uh, as the state's financial situation looks a little bit better. Um, and then um, uh, finally, um, wanted to mention that yesterday, Mr. Eisenhower and I had the opportunity to travel to Richmond with the uh, school board uh, to uh, for for school board lobby day uh, up in Richmond and uh, met with our four local legislators uh, to talk about uh, the school system's uh, um, wish list uh, for the legislative session as well as to talk about some possibilities for some significant savings um, that came out of the VML VACO uh, forum actually uh, with a suggestion that if the state finds itself in a position of having some additional revenue uh, that could be used to bolster our financial uh, security going forward, that a great way to do that would be to invest in the VRS fund, uh, and that could produce uh, 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 an investment of $140 million this year would produce a benefit of about $80 million to be split between state and local governments in perpetuity. Um, so year after year, we would get that uh, um, re reduction and it would really help us because it is one case where the composite index actually works to our advantage that uh, we would see a better a bigger reduction in our costs because we already carry such a large share of the salary and benefits of teachers so those are the things I I've remembered a couple of things I would like to say that we did um, we all were able to um, attend the Employee Service Awards this past week. It was, it's always a great honor to be included in that where we can congratulate our um, fellow James City County folks who love to work for, for the county and they do an amazing job. So it was a lot of fun to participate in that. And then I went to the Jamestown Historic Republican Women's Luncheon where I got to share with them things about the comprehensive plan update and things that they can purchase. They were very interested in knowing what they can do to participate in the community. So it was very encouraging. And I would just like to give a shout out to staff who um, recorded a new um, pre-meeting video. <laughs> Been requesting that for a while. I would just, the, the other one was starting to look a little tired. So anyway, I was looking a little tired in that video. So thank you guys for a new video. I appreciate it. All done. So I have, I've just done a whole lot, um, <laughs> as so has everybody up here. Uh, but and some of the things that I've participated in were the VACO VML, which was, I thought was very informative. Uh, also, uh, we have been participate. Mr. Stevens and I have been participating in interviews for uh, a new jail superintendent. And we have a jail meeting in the morning, and I see um, Sheriff Hardin here with us, who also a uh, brand new sheriff, but is also participating with us in that. Uh, had some holiday happenings with staff, um, and appreciate being included in that. And um, I wanted to mention that um, Mr. Sterling Nichols passed away in December. And I think because of the, the particular timing of our meetings that we were unable to mention it before, but Mr. Nichols was very active. He served on the EDA. In fact, Mr. Tom Tingle was one of the speakers at his funeral. Um, but Mr. Nichols 
did a lot, and he was a very kind man, and I appreciated his friendship. Uh, and he was also a champion of cleaning up the James River. And I think that will be his biggest legacy. That and his family, of course, he has a wonderful family. But he was very, very active in the James River Association. And I am very appreciative of somebody that lives very close to that river. I'm very uh, appreciative of all the work that he did. And so I want to thank him, Sterling, and um, thank his family, too, for all that um, that he did for this community and other communities. He um, It was very interesting, and his, um, Supervisor McLennan was there as well. These families that had met at Conway Apartments, many years ago when they were very young and had young families and then the the businesses that that grew out of that um but um mr nichols also um was uh, built apartments as, as his son said when he wanted to move off campus at james madison and he told his dad that not only did his dad get him an apartment but he built him a whole complex um <laughs> and he built in um i think radford Harrisonburg and Virginia Tech and um, so anyway he leaves a wonderful legacy so thank you you all about covered everything <laughs> <laughs> the um, employees awards and and the retirement was all always as a, a nice event in the county every year um, to watch the the new ones who have started have um, had five years with us and the ones that are going into retirement and doing something else with their um, next phase in life and we wish them all well it's amazing how lucky we are to have the employees in james city county that we have and and i can honestly tell you they are dedicated and they care about not only james city county but they care deeply about the citizens so i want to thank them service awards were outstanding i'm yep. sorry i did not yep. mention that it it was wonderful. So thank you to the county administrator for inviting other employees who were not uh, yes, actually receiving yes. the awards this year. I think that was really much appreciated. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Providing yes. hand sanitizer during flu season. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay, everybody else uh, covered all, all of my stuff except the, uh, You're welcome. the only one I had was um, I did go to mayors and chairs, and we actually started talking about several of the uh, regional uh, issues, and I'm going to let uh, uh, Mr. Stevens talk about the two that we discussed uh, at, at this particular meeting, um, but it, uh, it was beneficial. Uh, and then after, um, before we get to that, I've, I've got two requests of the board. Um, number one is um, we uh, made a committee assignments and then found out later that I'm got two that conflict. So we would like, I would like to see if we can have a motion to amend our board assignments to make Mr. Hippel primary for HRPDC and Harumpa with me as the alternate. And that would then allow me to attend alternate times when, I, when I'm available and still be able to attend uh, the uh, other one. No, I'm afraid I'm going to object to I'll second you on that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want a motion? Yes, I'd So like moved. Okay, do we have a motion? <laughs> Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. And then the last thing is I would like to um, get a sense of the board if uh, you are willing to, I think I sent this out by email, to ask the staff to bring back an initiating resolution in February for them to look at potentially changing our ordinance about retaining, uh, retaining walls. Uh, this would be uh, simply staff starting the process and the initiating ordinance would then allow the study and uh, uh, let them bring information to us and we could see if we really wanted to do anything or not but at this point um, we do have quite a few in the county that are significant problems two of them in, in uh, uh, Newtown and one out in Colonial Heritage uh, and so um, if, if there's a, a willingness on the part of the board to do that um, just by sense of the board if, unless there's any yes. objection okay so we will ask staff to bring that back. And, can I, can I, and, and also I'd like to, um, you know, if we could reach out to some of our engineering firms out there, I'm sure y'all will, but, but I'll reach out to them as far as what is, what should really be done, especially once you get over four and five foot with these retaining walls and, and the, the impact and, and um, you know, the testing and everything else resulting in that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, I did, I, 
if you'll um, beg the indulgence, please. I did want to mention that Grace Spoon, um, her, her mother passed away, and her mother was, I believe, a longtime employee of, of this county as well. That, did I hear 30 plus years? Is that possible? I would have told you 20 plus. So 20 it could plus. Have been 30, okay, but I didn't sorry. That now. But um, I'm, I just want to, of course, offer Grace and her family our deepest condolences, but also just how very touched I was by the number of county employees that um, came out to support Grace. I think that speaks to Grace, and I think that speaks to our employees as well. So um, I hope Grace knows that she has all of our sympathies and, and of course, and her mother's family too. I appreciate you remembering her mother. I would also mention her grandson worked here as well. So That's right. One of our police officers that started in the past year. And so yes. they've got a legacy here with the county of three generations Absolutely. working for us. Okay. Hey, we're through with board requests and directives. We are now to report to the county administrator. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, a few items to share with you. Uh, I will update more on the mayors and chairs at a later time. Back to the chairman's initial comments there. I will share some of that meeting with you and just do it in a different fashion so I can make sure I'm covering that accurately. Uh, I did want to mention James City County's fire and police departments are hosting a civilian response to active shooter events or CRAS, CRAS training session following, uh, followed by Stop the Bleed training that several of you have participated in. It will be Saturday, February 15th from 8.30 to 12.30, so a four-hour training session at the Fire Training Center uh, at 5077 John Tyler Highway. There is no charge for attendance, and the course is available for anyone 14 years or older. And it's one of those things I think is very important for community members to become involved in that. For additional information, they could call our Assistant Fire Marshal 565-7607. Again, our Assistant Fire Marshal 565-7607. Uh, a reminder to dog owners in James City County that you can purchase your dog license through the treasurer's office. The renewal period runs through January 31st, and the tags must be on your dogs by January 36th, 31st. And again, information is on our website, or you can call the treasurer 253-6705, again, 253 And then finally, the James City County Police Department's Citizen Police Academy has been offering members of our local community the opportunity to get an inside look at the operation and function of police procedures uh, since the mid-90s. Uh, the police department is currently accepting applications for our 50th Citizen Police Academy. Uh, it will run March 4th through June 3rd, and the application can be accessed on our website or by calling uh, Master Police Officer Jamie Lilly, 603-6027. Again, Master Police Officer Jamie Lilly, 603-6027. And that's all I have. Okay, we now have a closed session, and these are the items for our closed session this evening. Number one, discussion concerning positive, uh, number one, discussion concerning a prospective business or industry or the expansion of an existing business or industry where no previous announcement has been made of the business or industry's interest in locating or expanding its facilities in the community pursuant to Section 2.23711A5 of the Code of Virginia. Number two, consideration of a personnel matter, the appointment of individuals to county boards and or commissions pursuant to section 2.23711A1 of the Code of Virginia. That's planning commission appointments, board of equalization appointments, um, Virginia Peninsula Public Service Authority Board of Directors staff appointments, and Community Services Coalition Board of Directors staff appointment. Uh, number seven, uh, disposition of publicly held real estate where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating strategy of the public body, in particular, the unimproved right-of-way located along Overlook Drive pursuant to Section 2.23711A3 of the Code of Virginia, and number eight, cons consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual litigation where such consultation would have adversely affect the negotiating or litigation posture of the public body, in particular, the case known as Fout versus Laurel Lake Waterfront Property Owners Association, case number CL17-8698 pursuant to section 2.23711A7 of the Code of Virginia. And I will look for a motion. motion. to call and close session. And we have a motion. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Reisenauer? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. We are.
and uh, look for a uh, motion to certify our closed session. Mr. Chairman, move to certify that we only discuss those items we indicated we would discuss. Yeah, Mr. Stevens, we have a uh, motion. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carried. Okay. Uh, we have appointment. Uh, let's start with appointment to the Planning Commission. Uh, we will defer the one for the Roberts District and uh, Stonehouse District. Yes, so I'd like to make a motion to appoint Odessa Dowdy for the Stonehouse District Planning Commission for a term to expire January 31st, 2024, please. Okay. We have a motion. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Board of Equalization appointments. We have uh, four appointments to recommend to the, the judge. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I uh, move that we recommend to the Circuit Court Judge uh, the appointment of Michael Grimes, Vicki Nace, uh, Christopher Hedrick, and Robert Singley, Jr. for terms expiring on December 31st, uh, 2020. I believe. It's I'm sorry. Your term. I'm sorry. 2022. 2022. 2022. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a motion, Mr. Stevens. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, now we have an uh, appointment to Virginia Peninsula Public Service Authority Board of Directors for staff appointments. Um, Sir, Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, nominate uh, Grace Boone, the Director of General Services, to be our uh, representative, and Jim Hill, the Solid Waste Coordinator, to be our alternate. Mr. Stevens? Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. And finally, the Community Services Coalition Board of Directors staff appointment. Nominate Barbara Watson. Okay. Barbara Watson? Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. And that takes care of our. The eyes have it. Closed session. Aye, aye, aye. All right. Uh, we will now look for a motion to adjourn until 9 a.m on January the 25th, 2020, for a board retreat. Motion. A motion. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries.